Okay, we're going to review chapter seven, and we have two days to do this. So um, we're going to get, um, I'm going to go over all the formulas, and then in the next review video, we'll do some examples. And all along the while, you'll be doing your review packet and working problems and answering or asking questions in the Zoom session. Okay, we get our biggest idea in section 7a, just generally how we calculate probability. Now, there are a couple of types. Um, mostly there are theoretical probability and then experimental, but basically the formula is the same. So let me write this as if talking about, I'll write this like theoretical probability. We wanna figure out the number of ways A can happen. So the number of ways A successfully happens and divide it by the number of total outcomes or out the possibilities of outcomes. Now this is theoretical. So experimental would essentially be the number of ways of A and the total on the bottom. Okay? It would be the number of ways A did happen over the number of trials or the number of observations. So it's basically how many A and then how many total. That would be probability. We got um, the idea that the probability of A not happening with the idea that either it happens or it doesn't is one, which is 100% minus the probability of A happening. Sometimes it's easier to figure out a probability by using this. Okay, and then lastly in this section, we talked about odds for A. Odds for A is the probability that A happens over the probability that not A happens. Now, each of those is a fraction. So you can get to it this way. I like to think about this better. The text doesn't write it this way. The number of ways you have A over the number of ways you have not A. That way you don't have a complex fraction. We basically don't have that in both the top and the bottom because that would cancel anyway. Okay, these, this is our basis for um, the rest of what we talk about regarding probabilities, mostly this. This is our big idea. Okay, now let's talk about the next section, 7b. Okay, in this section we looked at situations that combined um, events. So um, we're going to get five formulas. So first of all, um, you need to decide, are you asking about and or or? So this would be, are you in band and choir? What's the probability of being in band and choir? What's the probability of being in band or choir? So and is going to be a lower probability and we're going to get it by a multiplication. When we multiply fractions, we get a smaller number. If they're independent of each other, one doesn't affect the, others, prob the other probability. This is our easiest case. Probability of A and B, we take the probability of A times the probability of B. And again, the, the resultant probability is smaller than either one by themselves. Now, if they're dependent, if A happening affects, happening or not happening affects B, then to find this, we're going to do um, the probability of A and then assume, a, assume that A has happened and we do the probability of B given A, okay? Assuming A happened. So this is going to be less um, than it would be if they were dependent, independent. Okay, both of these yield smaller probabilities. It's less likely that one thing and another happens. Now for or, it's going, they're going to yield a bigger probability than either uh, that we start with. If they're non-overlapping, if it can't be A and B, okay, so we're hunting for the probability of A or B, this is where it can't be A and B, then um, we take 
one probability and add it to the other. Gives us a bigger number. Now, if they're overlapping, we don't want to count. Um, we don't want to count the events here and here. So we find the same thing first. I think I'm going to run out of room. Let me rewrite this. Okay, so overlap. We first find um, for the probability of A or B, probability of A plus the probability of B. That part's the same. But we have to subtract the situations where they were counted twice in A and B. So we subtract the probability of A and B. This, if this is what's the probability of the, that the card is red or a king, well, this probability that it's red, probability that it's a king, and then we subtract the probability that it's a red and a king because we don't want to count it twice, okay? Okay, at least once. So um, the easiest way to find this is to subtract all of the other options um, because it, at least once could be once or twice or three times. So what we do to find the probability of at least once is take 100%, which is one, minus the probability that, let's say that A happens at least once, the probability of A at least once. We take one minus the probability of a not happening, not A. And we would say not A in all of the trials. Okay, now to figure out how many ways it doesn't happen in any of the trials, we're going to take the way it doesn't happen in one trial, not A in one trial, and raise that to the nth power because we want it to not happen the first time, not happen the second time, not happen the third time. And these are ands, not, not happen the first and not happen the second and not happen the third, okay? So um, the, going from here to here is connected to this formula. Okay, that was our, that's a big section. I say our biggest sections are a, where we define probability, here where we get our um, multiple events, or where we put events together, and then our last section where we do combinations, permutations. We'll be there soon. Okay, this was the section where we talked about large numbers. And um, the understanding that just because um, you know the probability, let's say it's one half, it doesn't mean if you're going to flip a coin twice, one time it has to be heads, one time it has to be tails. But if we flipped a coin a billion times, about half of them would be heads, half of them would be tails. The bigger the numbers get, the closer we get to these theoretical probabilities. So it's also the section where we talked about um, things that happen in large quantities, like um, insurance. <laughs> okay, so we measured expected we calculated expected values, the only formula in this section. So basically, we're going to multiply the value of an event, okay? So the value of event one times the probability of event one, okay? And then we're going to add the value of event two times the probability of event two, and we can keep going. However many possible events there are that affect this expected value. So um, mostly what you worked with here were, were insurance, um, insurance policies. So uh, insurance company sells a policy for a certain amount times one because they are going to get that premium, but then they're going to pay out for only a certain number of people. So we take that fraction of how much they pay out and, 
and add it, now that value would be negative. So we'd actually be subtracting it from the profit that the insurance company would make from the sale of this policy. So from basically from the premium. And, um, and then that's going to tell you how much they expect to earn from a single um, sale of a policy. Now, they won't ever earn exactly that. Some people will buy the policy and never make a claim. Other people will buy a policy and claim way more than they actually paid. Um, but it all works out in the end as long as the numbers are large. That's the big idea in this section. Okay, we didn't actually get any formulas in this section and it's one that people had some trouble with. Um, the title was assessing risk. And the idea was that um, when we make choices about um, what we should do, like right now, um, governors are making choices about whether we should continue our shelter in place policies or not. So um, we use the data to help us make decisions like this. And um, to, to understand the data, so to compare information or probabilities, we, we do that by getting common and useful units. So when we're looking at, for example, um, this COVID-19 situation, looking just at the number of deaths, for example, doesn't give us the whole story. We want maybe deaths per 100,000 people. That's a really common way we're seeing that number. So um, it's really a manipulation of the units to help us understand the numbers in order to make informed decisions. Okay, our last section, 7E, this is a really important section. So um, we got permutations and combinations. So permutation order matters. Combinations, the order doesn't matter. And the, um, the example that I think is helpful for remembering these words is that permutations is like electing president, vice president. Combinations is like electing a committee, okay? Where here we might want five officers, but they have specific roles. Here we might want five people, but they don't. They're on a committee. Okay, so for these formulas, um, we write them in terms of there are n items and we're going to select R. So permutations of n items and select R is um, R n factorial. I'm sorry, let me get this straight. Yeah, n factorial, that's the way all of them can be arranged. So if there are 20 people, it's 20 times 19 times 18 times 17, all the way down to one. But we don't need to arrange all of them. We only want to select R. So we're going to divide by n minus R. What that essentially does is it just, like if we were selecting 3 out of 15, it would be 15 times, 15 times 14 times 13. Stop. Okay. Now, combinations, we figure out the number of permutations. So this part of the formula is the same. But then we have to divide by the number of ways those R's can be, those R things can be arranged because we don't care how they're arranged. So we count one, two, three, and two, three, one the same. So we're going to divide by R factorial. And typically, um, these are pretty easy calculations to make, even when the numbers are big. But it's also helpful if you know how to do this on your calculator under the math menu. And, and then the submenu of probability there. Okay, in the next video, we're going to do examples of a mix of these. And um, you need to be working on your review. Bring your questions to Zoom. Goodbye.